Hyponatremia is a frequently encountered electrolyte disorder and employing a systematic approach is essential, both in clinical practice and for examination purposes. While considering volume status is theoretically beneficial as part of the hyponatremia diagnostic algorithm, a more practical approach to managing hyponatremia entails conducting specific diagnostic tests. By the end of this video, you will gain an understanding of the following essential points. Serum osmolality plays a crucial role in identifying whether other osmols contribute to hyponatremia. Urine osmolality is vital for determining the activation of ADH. Urine sodium levels are essential to assessing whether the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, RAS, is activated. If it is activated, this test also helps determine whether ADH secretion is appropriate or inappropriate. Serum uric acid levels are particularly valuable in differentiating between SIDH and other causes of hyponatremia. Hyponatremia is characterized by a low serum sodium levels of less than 135. When you encounter a hyponatremia case, ask yourself, what is causing the low sodium? Evaluation begins with the measurement of serum osmolality. Serum osmolality equals 2 times sodium plus glucose over 18 plus BUN over 2.8. It is a quick calculation to remember for your exam, so please memorize this formula in order to rule out other osmols contributing to the hyponatremia. If the serum osmolality is low, then you have a true hyponatremia. In true hyponatremia, the low serum osmolality drives water into the intracellular component, leading to a cellular edema and often leading to symptoms related to hyponatremia. If the serum osmolality is normal or high, consider conditions associated with false hyponatremia. In false hyponatremia, the low serum sodium level is associated with a normal or high serum osmolality and tonicity, and elevated serum osmolality draws water from the intracellular component to the extracellular component. There are two different types of false hyponatremia. A normal serum osmolality of 285 to 295 with hyponatremia is associated with pseudo-hyponatremia. If the serum osmolality is elevated and water doesn't move in or out of the cells, then think of conditions related to pseudo-hyponatremia. In pseudo-hyponatremia, both the serum osmolality and tonicity are normal. In this condition, the low sodium is due to an increased lipid such as triglycerides or high protein such as multiple myeloma and those receiving IVIG treatment. A high serum osmolality of more than 295 with hyponatremia is associated with factitious hyponatremia. In this condition, the extracellular component is hypertonic, causing water to move out of the cell. The water that moves out of the cell will dilute the serum sodium, causing a falsely low serum sodium level. Examples are hyperglycemia and patients receiving mannitol. The second step to assess the urine osmolality is to check the ADH activity. Ask yourself, is the cause of the hyponatremia ADH-dependent or ADH-independent? ADH secretion stimulates free water resorption in the collecting duct, resulting in an elevated urine osmolality. If the urine osmolality is low, of less than 100 to 200, then the cause of hyponatremia is an ADH-independent disease. This means that the ADH levels are low. The common causes of hyponatremia with low ADH level includes TNTO syndrome, beer polymania, and psychogenic polydipsia. In TNTO syndrome and beer drinkers polymania, the condition is related to a low solute intake, which is associated with a low ADH activity, which limits the ability of kidneys to produce urine that maintains electrolyte homeostasis, causing hyponatremia. In TNTO syndrome, the patient's primary diet is carbohydrates. The carbohydrates are metabolized to water and CO2. There are no solutes excreted, so it limits urinary output. In beer drinkers' polymania, the alcohol is also metabolized to water and CO2. Again, no solutes excreted, so it limits urinary output. The primary treatment is IV normal saline, which will then increase urinary output, increasing the sodium level. If the urine osmolality is greater than 200 to 300, then the cause of the hyponatremia is ADH-dependent disease. Therefore, ADH is active or present. If ADH activity is present, the next step is to identify whether ADH release is due to a low effective arterial blood volume, which is an appropriate ADH secretion, 
or is the ADH inappropriately released? In short, an elevated urine osmolality is associated with elevated ADH levels, but this does not tell us why ADH is active in the first place. If ADH is active, we are taught to check the volume status of the patient. Hypovolemic causes include renal and GI losses. Hypervolemic causes include cirrhosis, heart failure, and nephrotic syndrome. And euvolemic causes include SIDH, hypothyroidism, and adrenal insufficiency. However, physical examinations are not reliable. Specifically, it's difficult to determine a euvolemic patient from a hypovolemic or a hypervolemic patient. We now have to rely on urine sodium and serum uric acid to determine the cause of ADH-dependent hyponatremia. The primary reason to determine a urine sodium is to determine if the ADH release is appropriate or inappropriate. In hypovolemic and hypervolemic patients, the release of ADH is physiologically or appropriate. The body senses that there is a low effective arterial blood volume in both hypovolemic and hypervolemic patients, resulting in a RAS activation before ADH is activated. RAS is first, then ADH. This is an appropriate ADH release. In this case, the urine sodium is less than 20 with a high urine osmolality. A low urine sodium of less than 20 indicates that RAS is activated due to a low sense effective arterial blood volume. When RAS is activated, the angiotensin system in the proximal tubule and the aldosterone in the distal tubules result in an increased reabsorption of water than water follows. When there's about 10 to 15% blood volume loss, ADH is then released. This is a physiologic or appropriate response, resulting in a low urine sodium and a high urine osmolality. A urine sodium of more than 40 indicates that there is no RAS activity. If there is no RAS activity, then the body is not sensing that there is a low blood volume. Then why is ADH activated? If RAS is not activated but ADH secreted, this is related to an inappropriate ADH secretion. ADH release in euvolemic hyponatremia is unrelated to decreased perfusion from hypotension and volume depletion. In patients with euvolemic hyponatremia, their water intake exceeds the amount of sodium excreted. The three common causes of euvolemic hyponatremia are adrenal insufficiency, so check a cortisol level, hypothyroidism, check a TSH, and SIDH. Check a low BON and a low serum uric acid. Checking a serum uric acid level is helpful in determining if the cause is related to SIDH or another cause. A lower serum uric acid is helpful to identify that the hyponatremia is less likely due to a low effective arterial blood volume mediated ADH release. Remember in your step one, renal physiology key points. Both sodium and uric acid reabsorption occur in the proximal tubules. If there is a low effective arterial blood volume, there will be an increase in sodium and uric acid reabsorption. In an EABV expansion, such as SIDH, there will be a low sodium and a uric acid wasting, which results in an elevated urine sodium and uric acid levels, subsequently resulting in a low sodium and a low serum uric acid of less than 4. The differential diagnosis of SIDH includes CNS disease, such as tumor, histiocytosis X, and meningitis, drugs such as antipsychotics, narcotics, oxytocin, SSRIs, and sulfonylureas. Nausea is a potent stimulus of ADH release, perineoplastic syndrome, pulmonary disease such as TB, and pneumonia. A 50-year-old male patient presents to the ER with complaints of shortness of breath. Lab findings showed a serum sodium 126, urine osmolality of 340, and a urine sodium of 16. Which of the following is the most likely cause of his hyponatremia? SIADH, T and T syndrome, buponemia, or heart failure? The most probable cause of this patient's hyponatremia is heart failure. In heart failure, hyponatremia is characterized by an increased extracellular fluid volume, but a decreased effective circulating blood volume. The release of ADH is appropriate, along with a relatively high serum osmolality compared to serum osmolality. Due to the reduced effective circulating blood volume, the kidneys conserve sodium, leading to a typical urine excretion of less than 20. 
Tea and toast and beer pornomania is associated with a urine osmolality of less than 200 or 300. SIDH is associated with a urine sodium of more than 40. A 40-year-old male patient is being assessed for hyponatremia. His serum sodium is 126, B110, serum creatinine 1.0, a serum osmolality of 250, a urine osmolality of 420, and a urine sodium of 48. What is the most probable cause of his hyponatremia? Is it SIDH, T and toe syndrome, beer polymania, or heart failure? The most likely cause of his hyponatremia is SIADH. In SIADH, normovolemic hyponatremia is typically associated with a low to normal BON and creatinine levels. The urine osmolality is inappropriately high when compared to the plasma osmolality. Since the plasma volume remains normal in SIDH, the kidneys do not effectively conserve sodium, and this results in a urine sodium excretion of greater than 40. A 52-year-old male patient with schizophrenia arrived in the ER due to delusions. Sodium is 125, serum osmolality 260, urine osmolality 95, and urine sodium of 16. What is the likely cause of his hyponatremia? Is it SIDH from probably taking antipsychotics, polydipsia, or hypovolemia? The most probable cause of his hyponatremia is likely polydipsia. The urine osmolality of, is less than 100. This indicates excessive water intake, which is commonly observed in cases of psychogenic polydipsia or patients with in, inadequate solute intakes now let's review. What is the formula for serum osmolality? That's 2 times sodium plus glucose over 18 plus BUN over 2.8. How to distinguish between true and false hyponatremia? You have to look at the serum osmolality. In pseudohyponatremia, what is the typical serum osmolality range? Pseudohyponatremia is often associated with a serum osmolality between 285 and 295. What are the examples of conditions causing pseudo-hyponatremia? That's high triglyceride levels in conditions with high protein content such as multiple myeloma that can lead to pseudo-hyponatremia. In cases of fictitious hyponatremia, what is the typical serum osmolality level? In fictitious hyponatremia, this is often associated with a serum osmolality exceeding 295. What are the common examples of fictitious hyponatremia inducers? Those are hyperglycemia and those receiving mannitol are common causes of fictitious hyponatremia. When assessing for hyponatremia alongside a low urine osmolality, usually less than 100 or 200, which conditions may be involved? These conditions likely are related to T and toe syndrome, beer drinker's polymania, and psychogenic polydipsia. These are associated with hyponatremia and a low urine osmolality. If the urine sodium levels are above 40, does that indicate RAST activation? No, elevated urine sodium levels typically do not indicate RAS activation. What are the three common causes of hypovolemic hyponatremia? Hypovolemic hyponatremia can be caused by adrenal insufficiency, hypothyroidism, and SIDH. Which blood test can be helpful in diagnosing SIDH? A serum uric acid level of less than four is often a helpful blood test in determining if the cause is related to SIDH. Hyponatremia is a critical topic in the USMLE Step 2 examination and PrEP because it is a common electrolyte imbalance with significant clinical implications. Keep in mind that the USMLE Step 2 CK test comprises about 60% of internal medicine-related questions, and scoring well on this exam is crucial when applying for a residency program. Thank you for tuning in. If you found this valuable, please consider subscribing for more high-yield content that can assist you in preparing for your internal medicine shelf exam and Step 2 CK. 
Our YouTube channel and Instagram offer daily key points to enhance your Anki flashcards or notes. We provide short-form videos that cover essential concepts and offer guidance on approaching clinical questions. Thank you and have a good day.